Acts chapter 1 is where we're going to be looking at this morning. If you have a Bible and want to go ahead and turn over there, Acts chapter 1. Uh, as you're turning over there, before we get into the, into the scripture this morning, uh, I want to give an update from last week. Uh, ever since the church started over 50 years ago, on Homecoming Sunday, we've always taken up a special offering called the Fall Harvest Offering. And it always just goes to some type of, of special um, project that we're working on or some type of special event. Uh, going to do. And for the last couple of years, our focus has been paying down uh, and paying off the loan for this building and also the fellowship hall that we've built in the last uh, several years. Uh, we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the loan balance is around $120,000. So our fall harvest offering that we collected last week is going to go towards that balance. Uh, and last week we, uh, we, we collected $18,357. So, um, that's just a tremendous blessing. Uh, we talk about it all the time in meetings, and Mr. Jimmy mentions it every once in a while up here as well. Um, my goodness, thank y'all. I mean, everybody's just so generous. Uh, that's not with just a person or a family or a couple folks giving. Everybody's just generous to the kingdom uh, and, and the work that is going on within uh, within the Lord's church. Uh, that, that'll bring, um, I don't know, a, a of what the exact numbers are, but our monthly payment is somewhere around $3,000 a month on the loan, and we've been doubling that up for the last few years and paying six, and our estimates and kind of our goal is hopefully it can be paid off by January of 2025, so uh, thank y'all for, uh, then we'll just see what the next phase of, uh, of ministry is, but it frees up some funds to be able to, to do things for the kingdom. Look, one of the, uh, one of the undeniable facts uh, of the Bible is that God loves the church and God wants the church to grow. He has a great desire to see his kingdom grow. He has a great desire to see to see the church grow. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, we're told that God wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. In Ephesians 2, we're told that the only way that men can be saved is to hear the gospel that's going to be preached, that's going to be heard through the church. And in Acts chapter 2, we're told that when people uh, are saved, that the Lord then adds them to the church. W one of the most familiar parables Jesus tells is of the hundred sheep that a man had, and one goes off, and he leaves the 99 safely, and he goes in search of that one. He cares so much about his church, every person being brought into the church, every person being brought into the fold of God, that he's willing to leave and go after and look for, for every single one. He wants the church to grow. Paul, when he's talking about the church, frequently calls it the household of God and, and saying that it's built on the foundation of Jesus Christ and the whole purpose is that it can be built up. God wants his church to grow and if we as Christians and if we as a congregation are going to have the heart of God, that means that we, un, we want the, God's church to grow as well. We want the kingdom of God to grow. You know, if, if if we look at that, it's like anything in life. It We can look at making a difference on the global scale. We can look at making a difference on the on the broader kingdoms uh, uh, scale, but we can't do anything with that and have any impact on those larger things unless we look and get ourselves straight first. Uh, and make sure that we're doing what God has called us to do individually and what God has called us to do uh, as, as a congregation uh, personally. That's why I love the book of Acts. The book of Acts is probably my favorite book of the Bible to, to read about and, and study through because it is a history book of the early church. It gives us the history of the birth. Uh, and the growth of the early church. Uh, it tells us about, uh, about all the different things that were going on. And in the first seven chapters of Acts, uh, the whole church existed right there in the city of Jerusalem. It was born and existed in that one city. And then after that, their, their scope of their ministry spread out into other cities and, and in other nations and then to the whole world. But for those first seven chapters, it was right there in the book of Acts. And we see in those seven chapters that six times the church grew. And every time it grew exponentially. And if you go back and look at those chapters... We see and when you dive into the context that they had always done something. They always added an element uh, to following Jesus and added an element to their faith that led to the church growing there in Jerusalem. So what I want to do over the next six weeks is I want to focus on those six uh, periods of growth that the early church went through 
so that we can look at our, our church here in Gold Point uh, and that we can look at our lives individually to make sure that we're doing what God wants us to do uh, as, as, as a part of His kingdom. So if you have your Bibles open to Acts chapter 1, I want to give you a little context, and then we'll start uh, in verse 14 in just a second. Here's the context. Jesus had just died. He'd been buried. He'd, he'd ri- risen from the dead. And after that, after the resurrection, he spent 40 days going around and, and appearing to the apostles and preaching and teaching. And then he ascended back to heaven. Well, right before he ascended back to heaven, he met with the disciples, he met with his apostles, and uh, there was only 11 of them at that point because Judas had done and hung himself. Uh, So there's 11 of them, and he meets with them, and he gives them one last word of encouragement before he leaves. He says, look, I want you to go, and I want you to wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit comes. And they said, all right, Lord, we're going to do it. Now, they didn't even know what the Holy Spirit was. But they figured after a man had done conquered death in the grave, it was enough to have faith in him. So they go to Jerusalem, and they're waiting. And and it's those 11 men that are gathered together. We see that there's just a few more, and they're waiting. And verse 14 tells us specifically what they did as they were waiting. Verse 14 says, They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. So what were they doing? They were praying. Now, that's the only thing that we're really told that they were doing. They, they all joined together constantly in, in prayer. They were praying. They weren't doing anything else. They, they weren't preaching. They weren't singing. They, weren't, they didn't have any outreach ministries that were, that were going on. They were just praying. The 11 apostles, you got a few ladies. You got Mary, the mother of Jesus. You got his brothers there. So a group of maybe, what, 20 people are in a room and they're praying and they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to show up and and do something and tell them what else they're supposed to do next. They are praying and look at the results of their prayers in verse 15. Verse 15 says, in those days, Peter stood up among the believers, a group numbering about 120. Now, wait a second. In the very in the verse right before that, we're told that there was a group of maybe 20 people, the 11 apostles, Jesus' immediate family, and, and a few ladies that were praying. And then verse 14 says that the or verse 15 rather says that the number grew to 120. So where how in the world did the other hundred people show up? What did they do to reach another hundred people? Well, the only thing they were doing was praying. That is the only thing they were doing. They prayed, and the church grew by a hundred people before. I mean, it's even gotten kicked off. When you get into Acts chapter 2, it gets even better. So they're still together. They're still praying at the beginning of that chapter. They're waiting for the Holy Spirit to show up. He shows up. Uh, They preach the gospel. And by the end of that chapter, the only thing they had done outside of of preaching the gospel that day has been had been praying together. The church was born out of a prayer group and 3000 people ended up coming to Christ that very first day and and, and being baptized into his name. 3000 people. There's another element that we're going to look at that it was included in this growth. We'll look at that in just a minute. But we cannot overlook the importance of prayer to the growth of the church. It is absolutely key. The church was born from a prayer meeting and it grew from a prayer meeting. That happened 2000 years ago, but that's still the same that's still the same recipe for the church growing today. It's got to have that foundation of, of being rooted and and it all starts with prayer. Miss Joan Bennett said something to me about a year ago. Uh, we were talking on the phone and she said something to me that in, in the way that only Miss Jones says something. When she says something sometimes, it cuts you a little bit, and you bleed, and then she gets you. And then you realize, doggone, she's right. You know, and uh, <laughs> we were talking, I think it was, we were talking about one of her ailments. I think it was her uh, shoulder at the time. And uh, I said, well, Miss Joan, I wish you would get better. And she said, <laughs> she clapped back and said, honey, don't you wish anything for me? You can keep your wishes. If you're going to do anything for me, you better pray for me. And uh, she snapped back with that thing. And I was like, oh, okay. So we prayed before we got off the phone that day, you know. Uh, we, we prayed and everything. But I got to thinking about the thing. How true is what she said? What does wishing really accomplish? A lot of times in life we do, we wish for stuff. But do we stop and pray for it? You know, I hear it even in, in the church. I wish this would happen. Or I wish this person would come to Christ. 
or I wish that relationship that had been strained, man, I, 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 wish, they could, I, I wish they could be reconciled. Wishing is a very nice sentiment, but really, it doesn't get anything done. Wishing accomplishes absolutely nothing. Prayer accomplishes a whole lot. Prayer does stuff. Prayer changes stuff. Prayer is, is powerful. I love the prayer group that Miss Jessica started uh, over the last few months here on, on Thursday mornings. It's, it's just a small group of folks. Most folks working during that time of day. But at 10 o'clock every other Thursday, we get together and we just pray. That's all we're doing. Not outside trimming the bushes or replacing the shingles or, or feeding the hungry or anything else. There's no real outreach that is involved there. We're gathered together and we're lifting up prayer concerns to God in, in, in the name of Jesus Christ. And that's what we're doing, and that's all. And it is by my estimation that that's probably the most powerful ministry that we've got going in the church, is praying. Because that's what we see the early church did. All they did is gather together and pray, and they went from 20 to 120 to 3,000. And all they had done at that point is they had, they had just gathered together and, and prayed about that thing. We've seen some cool things happen. It was either the first or second uh, uh, group uh, time that we got together and prayed. Uh, we were praying specifically for those that, man, they're right there on the verge of accepting Christ. They're almost ready to, you know, they're ready to receive salvation, but they just haven't taken that step yet. And we specifically prayed about that on a Thursday, on a Thursday morning at 10 o'clock. Thursday afternoon at 4 o'clock, Mr. Keeter was baptized into Christ. That's good stuff. It gets even better. Mr. Keeter, in his wisdom, he's tricky. It, he, in his wisdom, he knew that he was going to have trouble getting up those steps and down those steps in the water and getting up and back out and everything. So he'd ask his friend, Mr. Larry Whitehurst, said, look, can you help me get up in, into the baptistry and everything? Tricky man. So he gets, uh, we get Mr. Keeter up and we get Mr. Keeter down and he's baptized. And then uh, Mr. Keeter, get, you know, we help him get, he gets about halfway up the steps and he just stops. And I'm about to say something to Mr. Larry. And I've opened my mouth to say it. And before I could get it out, Mr. Keeter turns around and he points at him and says, or actually he points down the water and says, all right, Larry, now it's your turn. And uh, Mr. Larry turned to me and he said, yep, he's right. It's my turn. So we baptized Mr. Larry in the Christ. And I was like, man, this is good stuff. I got looking around the room at some of the other ones that were in here. Too. But it was, that was some good stuff. That was powerful. But it did not escape my notice that this happened the day that we prayed for this to happen. That's powerful. I, well, Mr. Keeter, quite as long, but I've been praying for Mr. Larry to make that decision for 22 years. And the, the day that we all gathered together and specifically prayed about this thing to happen, it, it, it happened. Charles Spurgeon, the legendary preacher from back in the 1800s, when he began uh, preaching at the, at the church that he was at, they ran around 200 people uh, on their Sunday morning services. By the time he was dead, they, they ran over 5,000 people every, every Sunday. Uh, well, a group of young preachers one time went to visit, visit uh, Spurgeon and the, and the church there one Sunday morning. They got there early because they wanted to talk to the preacher. And, and they wanted to kind of interview him and see what the secret was, you know, what they had done to experience so much growth. And this, this young group of preachers, they went in, they were talking to Spurgeon. He says, well, let me give you a tour of the building. And they were all excited because they'd never seen anything so big. They went in, he showed them the, just the massive sanctuary that they had. And, and then he took and showed them the very impressive educational wing. And then he said, now guys, I want to show you the most important place in the whole church building. They're like, all right. He said, I want to take you and show you the boiler room. <laughs> they didn't want to be disrespectful, but they really had no desire to go see the boiler room of the church. You know, the power plant uh, back in, in, in that day and age, what ran, the, what ran the power for the church. They didn't really care to see that. Uh, that, was, that was not what they had been there for. But they didn't want to be disrespectful to Spurgeon, so they went along with him. He took them down into the basement. They got to a room. He opened the door, they looked inside, and there were a hundred people that were praying. He turned around and looked at him and said, that gentleman is the boiler room for this church. And all through Spurgeon's ministry, whenever someone would ask him what the secret to their success was, or what the power behind their ministry was, his answer was always the same. My people pray for the church, and they pray for me. I, I would ask, if you would only do one thing, if you could only do one thing for the kingdom of God, pray for the church. Pray for the church. There's a lot of things that the church needs to be prayed about. 
There's a lot of things that we as individuals that we need to be prayed about. But pray for your church because that is the boiler room for the church. A church can never outgrow and exceed the prayers of the people that sit in the pews. It can never grow further than what we're going to pray. So please pray for, for the church. That's the most important thing that we see that was laid down as that initial foundation before the church was ever even began. Now, I mentioned a minute ago that there was another element as the church was birthed that, that led it from that growth period from 120 up to 3,000. There was only one more thing that they did. They, they preached the word. In, uh, it, when, when the gospel, when, when Jesus told them to wait there for the Holy Spirit, at the beginning of Acts chapter 2, he shows up, and initially what the apostles did is we're told that they stood up and they preached the gospel message. It was very simple. They preached the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's it. When they got down towards the end of the message, Peter stood up. He was kind of the lead speaker there uh, from the apostles. And in verse 36, he says this. Therefore, let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he tells them, all these folks that are present that day, thousands of people that were there uh, to, to hear that first gospel sermon, that, to witness this thing, this great thing that the Holy Spirit was doing, the birth of the church. He told every one of them that because of their sins, they were guilty of putting Jesus Christ on the, on the cross. Every one of us. He's telling that message for us too. We're guilty of crucifying the Son of God because we have sinned. We're told in the next verse, verse 37, that when the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the other apostles, brothers, what shall we do? They knew they'd get been, they were guilty of murdering the Son of God. And they wanted to know immediately, what do we need to do to appease God? What do we need to do to escape his wrath? What do we need to do to be saved? And Peter responded in Acts 2.38. He says, repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Then he goes on, he says, this promise is for you, and it's for your children, and it's for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And then we're told that with many other words, he warned them and pleaded with them to save themselves from this corrupt generation. Then we get down to verse 41, it's so amazing. It says, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day. 3,000 people. The, the second key to the church growing the way that God wants it to grow is to add to our prayer the Word of God. We've got to stand on the Word, uh, on the word of God. The church cannot grow unless God's Word is preached. Now, I can stand up here every Sunday morning and I can give you a good motivational speech to where I make you feel good about yourselves. And I can... I can I can make it to where when you leave, you're going to feel like, woo, I'm going to heaven even if you ain't. And, and, and I can say it in a way that we can make you laugh about it. We can make you cry about it. And I can hit all them emotions and stand at the back door and you'll tell me I did a good job on the way out as you safely and securely go and get in your car and go home and nothing has changed. And nothing has changed in your life. But that's not my job. <laughs> if I do that, I have ripped you off. And when you stand before God one day, you're going to be ticked off at me. And when I stand before God one day, I'm going to have to answer for that. My job is to preach the word and it's to preach all of it. That means that, that we preach sin and salvation. That means that we preach heaven and hell. That means that we talk about the good stuff that we like to hear about and the bad stuff that we'd rather not. That means that Whatever it is that's in the word, whether it's picking on my sins or your sins or stepping on my toes or yours, that means that, that we, we touch on all of it. And, and that's, that's really the bottom line. That's my responsibility. And if I stand before God and I hadn't done that, then I'm going to have to give an account of that. Your responsibility in that is the same thing the early church did. We're told in Acts chapter 2 that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, which is the word of God. So my responsibility is to preach it, and then all of our responsibility is to devote our lives to, to try and to the best of our ability to live out God's Word. That is the only way that the church can grow the way that God wants it to. Now, we can get us a big old social club in here where we all feel good about ourselves and, and, and have some cool events and stuff. But unless we're devoted to the simple gospel message, 
of Jesus Christ and him crucified and we stand on the word of God, then this church needs to close its doors. If we don't stand on that, then we'd do a whole lot better to just go and join some some social club. It we've got to be we've got to be devoted to that. If we can do those two things, if we can be devoted to prayer and we can be devoted to the word of God. That's laying that initial foundation that we see from the early church. We see from the book of Acts that, that their growth kind of springboarded off of that foundation. And it's that foundation that, that we've got to recommit ourselves to every day. Every Lord's Day as we come together as a church. We've got to recommit ourselves to those things. We're going to be a praying church. We're going to be a church that's, that's foundation is on the word of God. And if that's the case then God can lead us through that next season of growth. Look, before we close this morning, I want to do something uh, a little different. I want to ask if our elders would come up here to the front. If y'all could make your way up here. Um, as we close this morning, I just want to pray for the church. We're told that that's how the church was born. We're told that that's what the initial uh, growth of the church, how it springboarded into action. And it was there in that room. They just prayed. They didn't do anything fancy. There wasn't no special lights or sound effects or fog machines or anything else. They prayed. And that was the power that, that, that started this whole thing in Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to ask our elders if they would just to simply pray for the church this morning as we close. 